Hints and Kinks for Electrical Artifact Conservation and Restoration by Robert Lozier, KD4HSH, Monroe, North Carolina. You can click Show More in the description below this video to see an index of topics covered in this presentation. Things I would like you to consider before you start. Is my new find a historic item? Have I researched to see if the historic value as found is greater than the commercial value? Aside from careful cleaning to slow additional deterioration, will this item remain more valuable if kept in original condition, given treatments to improve appearance, fixed up to, quote, work, made to look or work like new, or a Lazarus item to showcase your skills at transforming junk into something useful or decorative. Things I want to know when viewing an object. The obvious. What is it and what does it do? When was it made? Who made it? Where was it made? But there are other things that can make the artifact far more interesting. Knowing the background of the person or business that made the artifact. How was it received in the marketplace? Was it a successful product, niche product? one of many of its kind, unique or a failure? Did it infringe on patents or avoid patent infringement in novel ways? Were parts made in-house? Is the artifact associated with interesting personalities or events? What was the social, technical, and marketplace environment at the time that might have prompted an entity to produce such an artifact? How was the artifact advertised and distributed to potential customers? Show me vintage supporting documents, schematics, drawings, photographs, etc. Such knowledge will guide you in the best way to treat any specific artifact. When you take on such work, give some thought to documenting what you have done. You may have discovered or used methods not generally known to others. And now, on to some hints and kinks that you may be able to employ in the level of work you choose. In Atwater Kent's open sets, the components were interconnected using tinned, single-strand copper bus wire of about 18 gauge. All the top side wires and some on the bottom side were covered by lengths of sleeving generally called varnished cambric tubing. This tubing is tightly braided linen thread coated with multiple coats of translucent dark amber varnish. Over time, it becomes a dark glossy brown and most becomes extremely brittle. The unhappy truth is that some of the sleeving breaks off or is gnawed off by insects or mice, and replacements must be found. However, I have not been successful in finding any modern equivalents that come anywhere close to appearing true to the original. That sent me off on a quest to find a way to make convincing replica sleeving in my home shop. The following two slides describe a process that seems complicated but in fact takes only about an hour of labor spread over three or four days once you have all the materials at hand. It's very difficult to photograph this tubing, but maybe this shot will give you some idea of what is possible. Hobby shops have lengths of music wire used in model aircraft building. Buy a three foot length of 0 0.047 inch diameter wire. Make sure your wire is smooth and free of rust. Cut the wire into about 24 inch lengths. 
slip a length of 3 32nd inch 2 to 1 ratio thin wall polyolefin shrink tubing over the music wire and use a temperature regulated heat gun to carefully shrink the tubing. Begin at one end and move slowly along to allow air to escape completely. You cannot tolerate any trapped air bubbles along the finished diameter. If you do get an air bubble, you cannot work out. Take a very fine sewing needle and carefully poke a hole for air to escape as you reheat the area. But you don't want to make so large a hole that any glue can leak into contact with the music wire. There is a brand of 3 millimeter diameter waxed cotton beading cord available from firemountaingems.com. Similar 3 millimeter waxed cotton cord is available at some craft stores in 7 yard lengths. Do not use 3 millimeter cotton macrame cord or anything labeled thick cotton cord because the braiding threads are much too coarse. Beware that some online vendors have bold print and pictures at the top of their product pages that people would interpret to describe the product you are shipped. In this case, the bold print may say cotton, say ivory color, or Korea, when the fine print below says material 100% polyester and is brilliant white and the product has no country of origin and is shipped via China Post. On an attempt to return the product, you are told that the bold print is only a quote name and because the small print says material polyester, they refuse to accept return or issue a refund. Bizarre, but I'm told this is endemic to certain trading platforms. The correct waxed cotton bead cord consists of tightly braided fine threads over parallel strands of filler cord. It's easy to use tweezers to pull out the filler strands on a length of cord that is about one and a half times longer than your length of music wire. Your hollow braided cotton tube can now be slipped over the shrink tubing. Pushing this braid over the shrink tubing is not a fun task but I can do it in about 8 to 10 minutes when using the 0 0.047 inch wire. It's possible to slip over the next larger 0 0.055 inch wire, but it may take twice as long. When done, clamp a length of 2x4 lumber in a bench vise and drive or screw two heavy nails or wood screws just a little farther apart than your length of music wire. Securely tie one of end of your cotton sleeving to one of the nails or screws. Grasp the other sleeving end and work the sleeving to stretch it as tightly as practical along your shrink fit covered music wire before tying the end around the other nail or screw. When finished, take a gauze pad saturated with lacquer thinner to wash out most of the wax on the thread. Now you are ready to coat your sleeving with alcohol-based medium walnut wood dye. I used Mohawk Ultra Penetrating Stain. The sleeving will dry to a milk chocolate color. After drying, coat the sleeving with a mixture of Tight Bond 2 Extend Slow Set Veneer Glue and the same wood dye mixed to the color of milk chocolate. Use a short bristle hog's hair brush to vigorously massage the glue into the braid, but finish by removing any excess from the surface. I simply wrap a bit of plastic wrap around the sleeving and just pull it along with my fingers. I repeat the process and allow the glue to dry completely. You can then use a bit of 220 sandpaper to knock down any rough spots along the length. Finish by dragging a small wad of 4 out steel wool across the length. If you think you have lightened the color of your length too much, wipe a thin coat of the stain onto the length and allow to dry. 
cut away enough cotton sleeving and heat shrink tubing to expose one end of the music wire. Cut the other end free of its nail. Put on clean rubber gloves and clamp only the exposed music wire into a secure bench vise jaw and carefully pull the tubing off the wire. Do not attempt to pull with the expectation that the sleeving will release all at once. Instead, pull just a little bit at various points along the length and repeat a few times. Eventually, the sleeving will begin to slide off smoothly. Note that the shrink fit tubing remains as the inside wall of your finished product and the gloves prevent skin oils from contaminating your tubing for the final step. The sleeving is brushed with satin finish exterior marine spar varnish. This varnish has a heavy body and a transparent amber hue. Indoor spar varnish is much thinner, often has no tint, and therefore will have more the appearance of a clear plastic glaze. Note that there are glossy versions of these varnishes that you should avoid. The finished varnished product appears very, very close to the size, look, and function of the original varnished cambric tubing, so close as to be intermixed with the vintage sleeving without attracting undue attention to how clever you might have been in your restoration activities. A better way to clean photo etched brass tags. If you can remove an etched brass tag like this, you may be able to do a really good restoration. Clean the tag with soapy water and an alcohol wipe. Do not attempt to remove remaining paint. Scrape away heavy corrosion on edges of the tag in any heavily oxidized text, but don't overdo it. Brush on a thin coat of lacquer paint where necessary. Don't worry about precision painting. Allow the paint to fully cure. Bake it with a little heat from a lamp or let it dry overnight if necessary. You remove the excess paint by rubbing the face against a virgin sheet of MDF shelving. As you rub, clean the residue off the MDF with a cabinet maker's scraping card. I do not recommend using any form of sandpaper. Dissolve sodium bisulfate and hydrogen peroxide and apply a few drops to virgin MDF board. Sodium bisulfate is the dry acid crystals used to lower the pH in swimming pools. It is cheap and widely available. Rub the face of the tag in the solution. Use your cabinet maker scraper card to remove old solution and repeat until all brass highlights are clear yellow brass. Rinse the tag in clean water. Protect the brass with clear lacquer ideally with a few drops of transtent honey amber transparent dye mixed in. Apply using an airbrush. You don't want the black and red paints you just applied to smear when you try to apply this overcoat of clear lacquer. Problem. A person had removed these transformers from the asphalt and discarded the asphalt. The transformers were free to slide around. I have no good source or way to add replacement material. I discovered that you can purchase black hot melt glue sticks online that have the same color and luster of the old asphalt. However, note that there are translucent and opaque versions. You want the opaque version. These work fine for any application where significant heat will not be encountered. This material would absolutely not be acceptable for use in a potted AC power supply, such as that in the Outwater Camp Model 40. It's also not appropriate to use in closing the ends of capacitor sleeves that you have stuffed with modern components.
need flexible wire, use modern UL3132 silicone rubber wire, 24 gauge. This modern insulation certainly looks out of place in such vintage equipment, so cover the wire with braided cotton sleeving, the same cord you used in the replica sleeving just mentioned a few slides back. It's easy to color with writ fabric dye. Protecting AK Bakelite moldings and brass socket shells during removal. On several occasions, I've needed to remove the brass tube socket shells of Atwater Camp Bakelite molded modules in order to properly clean them or to repair the damaged Bakelite. The two heavy brass tabs of the shell are crimped and very difficult to straighten without damage. I found that it is easy and very safe to bend these tabs by using a jig that is simply a wood dowel turned to the exact inside diameter of the shell. Make the dowel longer than the tube shell so that you can clamp the base of the dowel in a bench vise. In the center of the dowel, drill a quarter inch diameter hole to take a length of metal rod. Cut a length of 1 8 inch thick fiberglass, aluminum, or steel and drill a quarter inch diameter hole in from one edge to provide an ideal fulcrum point for a flat screwdriver blade. Note that it should not be necessary to bend both tabs fully perpendicular. Only straighten the absolute minimum necessary to release the shell. This eliminates virtually all possible stress from the Bakelite. The tube contact leaves usually do not have to be removed as shown in these pictures. Just loosen the four 348 screws holding the leaves and there will be just enough room to insert the quarter inch rod. I forgot to take a photograph, but here you can see that if you have a plate with two holes, you can use the screwdriver blade to gently bend the tab back towards its original stake position. But I would recommend that you do not attempt to stake it completely. Instead, bend the tab maybe one third of the way and then apply a bead of low temperature silver bearing solder to the tab to tighten the stake. A simple way to support lightweight radio chassis. These types of chassis often have fragile basket weave RF coils mounted to the top side. Protect them while repairing the chassis. Glue wood dowels into scrap tube bases and plug them into the tube sockets. Not a universal solution, but if you have sturdy tube sockets, this can be quite effective. You need to adopt this habit for all work you do. Metal oxides are very poor conductors of heat. Adopt the habit of brushing old solder joints before attempting to desolder for the first time. It only takes a few seconds to use a clockmaker's scratch brush with steel or fiberglass bristles to remove this thin film of oxide over the solder. It will greatly speed heating of the joint. A little difficult to show here, but Gilder's paste wax can be used to fill in highly corroded nickel plate after cleaning. The rotor on this tuning capacitor is a staked assembly of aluminum and brass and cannot be plated with nickel again. Most of the nickel is still there, though highly perforated. After cleaning in an ultrasonic cleaner or whatever method you use, this appearance can be improved quite a bit by applying silver gilder's paste. Buff and allow to dry for several hours. Then you can fix the pigment by spraying, not brushing, with light coats of clear lacquer. Tinning the lacquer with a few drops of honey amber transparent dye makes the touch-up even less noticeable.
Soldered pin plugs on old tensile cords were used almost universally for headphones and loudspeakers of the 1920s. Classic tensile wire is a flat copper foil wrapped around a core of linen thread. The highest flexibility of any wire construction method, but practical only for low current applications. If the linen thread is not dry rotted, the cord can be repaired. I have found that there are two sort of secret ingredients to repair success. Number one being the use of a clockmaker's fiberglass scratch brush to buff the surface of the copper tinsel free of oxides. You just don't have the luxury of applying high heat and aggressive fluxes to clean away oxides on these old copper conductors. The fine fiberglass bristles do a quick and superior job of oxide removal. And number two, unify the wire strands by wrapping with a single strand of 30 gauge silver plated copper wire. This wire was used for several decades to wire backplanes of computer circuitry. Spools of number 26 and 30 gauge Kynar insulated wire are frequently found at large ham fest and small hanks of the wire can be found on eBay for not a lot of money. Take time to carefully trim the braided jacket. An easy task if you have a serrated blade iris scissor easily procured off of eBay. With a neat trim of the braid, it is easy to begin your winding over about the last remaining 1 8 inch of the braid and then continue down over the tinsel wire. Work to make as tight a wind as practical. Once you're done, apply a drop of resin or no clean flux and then quickly apply low temperature solder. The best solder will be 6337 10 lead alloy. If you have an adjustable temperature soldering iron, lower its setting to 250 degrees C. If you are using an old tip plug, take the time to clean out the old solder and flood with new low temperature solder. Heat the plug and plunge your prepared wire into the solder. Clean your work with alcohol and let dry. To add more strength to your work, apply a drop of Dritz Freycheck cloth adhesive to reinforce the braid. It might not be as bad as you think. A number of post-World War II portable radios and televisions were covered in impregnated and sometimes embossed fabrics that can appear hopelessly soiled. Before consigning yourself to scrapping the case or replacing the covering, give this cleaning method a try. There are inexpensive synthetic bristle paint brushes that come with what are called flagged bristles. I've found that you can bind these types of bristles very tightly with a strong rubber band to form an eraser that will penetrate into the uneven surface of these coverings like nothing else. Your best cleaning solution for your eraser is cream style waterless hand cleaner and the pad is best worked using very short circular strokes. Wipe the soil away frequently with a soft towel and apply fresh cream. With patience, you can sometimes achieve amazing results. Certainly a lot easier than attempting to recover your cabinet. This super rare wireless specialty apparatus company, Radiola Concert Crystal Receiver, was going to require a total disassembly to repair the mounting foot for the variometer and to flatten the badly warped panel. The 12 gauge square bus wire was originally tinned, but 99% of that tin had turned very dark. Most of the bus wire terminations were soldered. So since this set was going to require radical repairs, I determined that the bus wire should be returned to its original tinned condition. One of the greatest sins in servicing vintage radio devices 
is the failure to use soldering irons with sufficient thermal mass at the tips. Joints such as these bus wires and large screws attached to heavy terminals sink heat very fast. You wind up cooking everything in the area while the small heater and tip slowly recover temperature enough to cause the solder to melt and flow freely. Experienced workers know that far less damage is done if the joint heats quickly. These high wattage soldering irons are frequently found at Hamfest for around $30, and many are listed on eBay for not much more. Be aware that old versions of these irons used cords heavily insulated with asbestos. If the cords and plugs are in fine shape, no problem, but repairing the cord can expose you to the dangers of inhaling loose fibers. Once the wires were removed, they were cleaned in my ultrasonic cleaner using a solution of 3% hydrogen peroxide and a teaspoon or so of sodium bisulfate dry acid crystals. Even if you don't have an ultrasonic cleaner, the cleaning action of non-ferrous metals is outstanding. Brass parts come out without exhibiting an excess of copper, giving it a pink blush, and copper looks like it's freshly cut metal. After cleaning the wire, it's going to appear rough. This is an ideal opportunity to use a vibratory polisher charged with ground walnut shell media. After four hours, this copper wire was smooth and ready for a final clean and plate. Immersion tin plating dry chemicals and prepared solutions are available for those doing hobby fabrication of printed circuit boards. It requires only room temperature solutions where the chemically clean copper can stay submerged for 10 or 15 minutes. Remove from the solution and flush with clean water. Immediately force dry with a hairdryer and then spray or dip the wire in clear satin lacquer. On soldering, the lacquer will vaporize and not interfere with your solder connection. It really bugs me that wiper blades cannot be recycled and that I cannot any longer get just replacement blades. Wipers have two stainless steel strips supporting the rubber blade. They fit perfectly in saw slots to provide sturdy part support with very small contact area. Tacks or magnets on the parts keep them from being blown around. An even better use. Old wiper blade stainless steel insert strips can be used to repair leather luggage handles on portable radios. Slit the stitching along one edge of the handle. Heat the stainless steel strip where you want it to bend to a red heat with a torch and let cool naturally to take out the temper in the steel. Use a bit of fine wire to capture tails of the stainless steel strip. The leather may crumble to dust, but this steel strip will never fail. Now you have to replace the stitching. A $7 sewing awl from Harbor Freight has needles far too large for our use, but is otherwise okay. Fabric shops have a large sewing machine needle that is specified for leather sewing. A five pack of needles is about $9. It matches the size needed for luggage handles. Stitch with wax, embroidery floss, or nylon cord. Insert a large needle just ahead of where you're working in order to find the old stitch holes and bring everything into alignment. Once you get the hang of it, it's possible to complete stitching like this in about an hour. The old torn fragile leather can now be saturated with DRITS Freycheck clear PVA adhesive and clamps back into position. 
Your stainless steel strip is now taking the stress off the old handle for a very long time. Nineteen twenties and thirties luggage coverings used on portable radios are often found flaking and tearing. They can be reinforced. Available at most craft stores, Aileen's Fabric Fusion Permanent Fabric Adhesive dries to a flexible film, but is too thick to flow on fabrics and fissures. But it, it is easy to dilute with two parts toluene to one part glue. This solution dries much too fast to be effectively applied with a brush, but there is an easy alternative. Use a disposable micro pipette to distribute the solution along weakened fabric and boundaries of brittle coatings. Wait a couple of minutes and repeat up to about four times. In this case, I had the hinge unfolded so that the damaged fabric was humped up and away from whatever was below. I don't think it's a good idea to risk having the flexing fabric bond to random points on the structure below. Sometimes you just want it to work. 1920s vintage radios with open audio transformers, that is. Is there a way to do it without replacing the original bad audios? In many instances, yes, there is. I sure don't want to see this kind of abomination employed just to get her going again for a little while. For decades, the easy way to make these sets, quote, work is to substitute RC coupling for the step-up audio transformer. The penalty was the fact that with RC coupling, there's no voltage gain provided by the transformer, so amplification will definitely suffer. Enter the world of surface mount components high performance with minuscule sized parts. The opportunity to build a functional replacement so small that it can often be completely hidden. The only necessity is to open a few circuits to the original part and tack in new connections. The postage stamp size circuit board holds 10 parts. In small quantity, this assembly can be distributed currently for about $14 plus postage. This board was designed by Jay Kennard, and I did the board layout. The actual board measures 0.7 by 0.85 inches and is less than one-tenth of an inch thick. This is the circuit. Just by changing two component values, the gain can be set for 3.5 instead of 5. General distortion levels are in the range of 6%, which is typical for 1920s vintage radio designs. Jay designed a hi-fi version with 2% distortion by adding another Darlington and one more resistor. But I sort of think that you are committing the sin of making the circuit work better than new. I've not laid out a circuit board for that circuit, but Jay has done one that uses through-hole parts, so it has a larger footprint and is 0.3 inch thick. My junk boxes yielded these parts for a set testing fixture. A pair of Thordarson audios on plug boards and a matching set of plug boards equipped with spring clips to connect the little printed circuit boards. This makes A-B comparisons easy. This setup demonstrates that there is some variation in the way the transformer and the substitution board affect the optimum grid leak detector settings. The filament voltage on the detector I'm using here needs to be tweaked 5 or 10% to optimize the audio level. I regard this as a trivial matter. When used between the two audio stages, you can tell that the solid state circuit exhibits pretty much linear gain over the useful frequency range from say 50 Hertz to eight kilohertz. 
whereas you're probably aware that the audio transformers of the 1920s definitely exhibit a decidedly nonlinear gain over the same frequency ranges. Fortunately, this only jumps out to the casual listener if you're doing direct A-B comparisons. You can sometimes hide the board inside a transformer shell, as in this interstage transformer used in radial threes, etc. Just unsolder the transformer leads from the tag board and push down out of the way. Plenty of room to tack on the new circuit. Here is the application in the fascinating Oreo Model 100. This is a radio where I really wanted to analyze the performance of the cathode follower RF amplifier circuits, but it has an uncommon open audio transformer in a really awkward location, but no problem. The bad boy can stay exactly where it is and underneath the chassis, two wire connections were simply unsoldered. The solid state board is wrapped in a slip of black paper. The 24 gauge wires to the board are covered with black cotton braid and the connections are tacked in place. Here the board is practically hiding in plain sight. The set performs virtually identical with a comparable transformer of the day and this radio with its original parts in place remains an accurate historical reference. My documentation of this radio identifies the use of this little subterfuge. Here you see the same idea. The boards were simply tacked in place to check out basic operation, then a final location chosen to stash the boards. Here, all that was necessary to disconnect one good winding of one of the transformers was to unsolder the leadout wire from the lug and push the wire back through the brass eyelet. As of June 2020, 31 of these units have been reported as installed with no failures. Preserve the very few that are left. Mains powered vintage radios were never designed to function without repairs for decades. It's very rare today to find completely original sets 60 plus years old. When you do, please recognize the value in keeping accurate historical reference items of the technology of the day properly clean, but factory original. For example, this pristine original FEDA 260B circa 1936-37, after 80 plus years, is not going to work safely without various new parts. The fact remains that with historical items, you are never more than the current owner in a line of owners that will hopefully continue for many years if the artifact is properly cared for. There are many other similar sets that have already had their historical reference values severely compromised by typical shop repair methods. Here you can employ your own repair techniques guilt-free until another part fails and a little more historical value is lost. So this is the end of my group of hints and kinks for this session. In working to preserve historical artifacts, there is a constant need to review preservation and restoration techniques. Old materials such as solvents, coatings, replacement parts, etc. drop from the marketplace. Some are replaced with newer alternatives, but others are not, making it necessary to develop entirely new techniques. The passage of time can sometimes identify problems of the durability of old accepted methods of preservation or restoration. The advent of CNC machining and 3D printing is opening up exciting prospects for their application to the science of restoration. And some of these techniques are becoming even affordable for amateur practitioners of conservation and restoration. 
Photography and information exchange via the internet is providing enhanced ways to educate about these new methods, potentially reducing the chances of damage to irreplaceable objects. Hints and Kinks for Electrical Artifact Conservation and Restoration by Robert Lozier, KD4HSH, Monroe, North Carolina. You can click Show More in the description below this video to see an index of topics covered in this presentation.